Hello, I'm Kristen Eikens here. I'm a professor at the University of Virginia School of Law and the director of UVA's National Security Law Center. I'm delighted to moderate our panel today on information conflict in the digital age. I'm going to introduce each of our four fantastic panelists who have deep expertise in cybersecurity and related issues. The first is Commander Robin Crabtree. She's a US Navy judge advocate currently serving with US Central Command. She served in various capacities in the United States and overseas, including as Associate Deputy General Counsel for Intelligence in the Department of Defense's General Counsel's Office, as Operational Law Advisor to the Chief of Operations for Military Operations in Iraq, Legal Advisor to the Convening Authority for Military Commissions, and in the Office of the Judge Advocate General of the Navy. Most relevant to our discussion today, she was the Lead Action Attorney in the Department of Defense's Office of General Counsel, for U.S. military operations to counter foreign information operations targeting U.S. elections and the COVID-19 response. She also advises on U.S. military information operations. Next is Harriet Moynihan. Harriet is a senior research fellow in the International Law Program at Chatham House in the U.K., and she leads the program's cyber work there. Prior to joining Chatham House, Harriet was a legal advisor in the U.K. Foreign and Commonwealth Office, where she advised on a wide range of public international law issues. And before that, she was an associate solicitor at Clifford Chance LLP. Jens Olin is a professor of law at Cornell Law School, where he's currently serving as the interim dean. Jens's work focuses on the intersection of criminal law, criminal procedure, public international law, and the laws of war. His latest research project involves foreign election interference, and he just published a book with Cambridge University Press entitled Election Interference, International Law and the Future of Democracy. He also has an edited volume forthcoming on defending democracies, combating foreign election interference in a digital age. And finally, Sujit Brahman is a partner at Sidley where he focuses on privacy and cybersecurity. Prior to joining Sidley last fall, Sujit served for nearly a dozen years as a federal, federal prosecutor, including as Associate Deputy Attorney General at the US Department of Justice. At DOJ, he advised the department leadership on cybersecurity related investigations and prosecutions and led policy formulation on areas including cross-border data transfer, facial recognition, and encryption. He was also the lead U.S. representative in international data sharing negotiations with the U.K., Australia, and the EU, and he chaired the Attorney General's Cyber Digital Task Force. Prior to his time at Main Justice, Sujit served for over eight years as an assistant U.S. attorney in Maryland. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists just to kick off with some um, thoughts about sort of the general phenomenon of information conflict. So governments have obviously long used propaganda and disinformation against other states. So do you see this current era of internet enabled disinformation as just a difference in quantity and speed, or is it really a difference in kind? And does international law need to be less permissive now about internet operations or about information operations than it has been traditionally given these differences? So Harriet, can we come to you first? What do you think about uh, the differences wrought by the current era? Sure. Thanks, Kristen. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with ASIL and to be on this panel. So um, thank you for having me. Um, I would say that um, on your first question about whether or not these information operations are basically just a question of different speed and quantity, because obviously uh, we have the Internet and that's very different from the analog world, um, where previously propaganda was conducted through much more basic methods. Um, I think there are, it's not just about quantity and speed. I think there are certain features about cyberspace that we need to look at. Um, one of them is the, the science um, of attention and the fact that um, these information operations can be pushed towards certain individuals who may be more likely to fall prey to them um, using techniques like data harvesting um, and micro-targeting. Um, and I think also the fact this is a more of a contextual point, but the information environment we're operating in, it doesn't have those information gatekeepers that we would have had previously. So mainstream media would have been the way that people got their news um, or mainstream in institutions and politicians previously. And there's been a loss of trust in a lot of those. And so individuals are starting to kind of filter the information they get themselves. Um, I think that is a different factor um, and finally, I think um, there are more opportunities in cyberspace for anonymity, um, for basically conducting these operations covertly. And as a result, much more difficult to find out who's doing them and tr to trace them. Um, so I think all those factors need to be uh, sort of added in. And, and I think they make quite a, a dangerously effective combination. Um, just picking up on your other question, Kristen, about 
whether or not the international law needs to be more or less permissive than it has been to date. I think that begs the question about how the law treated information operations in the first place. And um, to me, the main area of law that springs to mind is the principle of non-intervention in another state's affairs, because often traditionally propaganda would be analysed through that prism. And I think just, just taking that quickly, because I'm sure we'll come back to it in this discussion, um, it, you know, that's an area of law that's well established, but it's always been quite an uncertain area of law, in particular in relation to its scope. Um, it's it's been hard to know what the line is between legitimate influence and illegitimate manipulation and interference. And there's also been considerable debate between states about how to interpret it, considerable differences in how it is interpreted. So I suppose um, it's maybe less a question for me about more or less permissive as sort of taking these existing rules and working out how they apply in this new environment and whether or not they need adapting. Great. Robin, can we come to you next? Yes, so thank you for having me. Um, so I, I agree with a lot of the, um, the things that Harriet just pointed out. Um, and from, from my perspective as well, I think this is something that has been happening since we had governance structures. And I think that the types of information operations have been very consistent over time, trying to divide societies, um, um, conducting operations to convince governments that their population really supports policies that are actually in favor of um, or support the interests of another state. Um, and I do think that there's a difference of quantity and speed. And I think that the point that Harriet made about it's not only that you can deliver things really quickly and that you can deliver a lot of it really quickly, but there's this um, engagement with the target audience that I think really is new and that you didn't have when it was pamphlets and, and so forth. And not only can you engage with them, but you get this real time feedback on exactly how they think about what you are sharing and what their reactions are, and you can adjust. Um, and I think politicians who are not engaged in you know, targeting foreign governments, like that's exactly what they're doing, right? And media companies, like these tools weren't built by Russian intelligence. These tools were built by media companies and um, internet companies. Um, but, but I think that actually the, those same changes in the information environment make the information environment more resilient than it was, let's say in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Because what you have is, um, you know, so let's say something preposterous, you know, circles around on the internet and lots of people love it and they're super emotional about it. Um, but just as quickly as that gets out there, you can have other speakers who are putting up um, information that is contrary to that. And they have the exact same tools available to them. So, um, so and, I, and I think also that the, the gatekeeper point is a really interesting point because it's not, one could argue that what caused the um, erosion of trust in those individuals um, is that you had more speakers and with more speakers bringing information into the environment, maybe we realize that we weren't always being told the truth by political leaders, by mainstream media and those types of things. So, um, so I, I think that those same tools um, that, that are contributing to the threat actually contribute to what I think is the solution. And in terms of whether international law needs to be um, less permissive, I, I would tend to say no, because I think if we start to go too far in that direction, then we are going the direction of China and Russia and so forth. Um, and I think we start to infringe on some of that speech that is actually probably the most useful in encountering that the bad information that's in the environment. So, um, so I'll leave it there. But yeah. Jens, how about you? So <clears throat> I'm inclined to think that the the major difference uh, in you know information operations today versus the past is you know that they're a full force multiplier um, and they are. Um, easier to marshal um, and deploy uh, compared to disinformation campaigns of, of past generations. 
Um, you know, I think in the past it was very much a resource intensive operation and usually it was great powers who had intelligence uh, agencies that were fairly large um, and had the resources to, you know, to, to launch a disinformation campaign. I think now it's flipped around and I think it's, it can be, it's got the potential to be the reverse, which is um, countries uh, that have fewer military resources um, or fewer, uh, 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 less economic cloud on the world stage will use information operations as a way of asserting themselves in a very cost-effective and efficient manner. So for a relatively modest outlay in um, time, energy, and, and money, <clears throat> they can build a troll farm or some other form of disinformation campaign. So I think that's really the difference. Um, I wouldn't describe that, though, as a difference in uh, kind. I would describe it as a difference in degree. But for me, that doesn't make it any less worrisome. I mean, I think there's a lot of um, examples of, uh, you know, things in life uh, which are old wine in, in new bottles, um, which uh, are deserving of international legal regulation. Um, murder has existed since the beginning of mankind, and it's one of the most prevalent problems, and so is armed conflict and war. And there will always be armed conflict and war, but international law has to has to tackle it. Um, in terms of you know whether the the rules should be more permissive or or less permissive, I think I I, I come down where Harriet was, um, which is that it's a question of law application to fact, um, and it's the the very difficult job of figuring out how to um, you know apply these examples to existing legal standards, um, which have existed for a really long time. Um, you know, like non-intervention, uh, or in in in, in my case, um, self-determination. These are not easy standards to apply, and figuring out um, how a disinformation campaign should um, you know should be um, evaluated under that under that paradigm, I think, is the the chief task for international lawyers. Great, that's a task I want to get us to in in a few minutes here after we um, have Sujit weigh in on this initial question. So, Sujit, what 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 do you think? Is this just a difference in Speed? Is it a difference in quantity? Is it a difference in kind? How should we think about this? Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Uh, and it's great to be on this panel with so many distinguished co-panelists. I, I would really echo what, what Jens just said. Um, you know, for me, it seems like what really sets this paradigm apart from what's come before is that information operations allow less powerful states to punch above their weight and yet below the threshold of the use of force, right? So they're able to essentially play with the bigger power but do it in a way that does not trigger an armed response. And that's asymmetric. It really empowers, in a, in a very interesting way, reinforces the traditional Westphalian model, right? Nation states are able to sort of take their place as peers with other great powers, and at the same time, use information operations against their own people. I and mean, these are often authoritarian regimes, and use that power to consolidate their own authority within their borders while exporting their influence in a way that they traditionally would never would have been able to, right? So that's one very interesting dynamic of all this is that we live in a digital age. We talk about the uh, increased, you know, uh, sort of speed and uh, the nature of the internet. And yet in some ways it has really empowered some very, you know, revanchist type powers, you know, governments. So that's one very interesting dynamic in all of this is on the one hand, it is the sort of stronger, uh, wealthier nations that are sometimes most impacted. Uh, though, of course, you know, nations like Russia have been pretty non-discriminate in how they've tried to, to use their information operations to influence those around them. So I think it's a very difficult question to answer. There are certainly questions of speed, certainly questions of scope. And yet, in some ways, it's reinforced this, you know, model of international relations that was, frankly, starting to, to get a little bit weaker towards the end of the 20th century. On the question of how does international law deal with all of these questions, also, I think a little bit, uh, you know, difficult to answer at this stage. Most of the vocabulary we've been using so far relates to the law of conflict, the law of war. There's obviously a human rights dimension to all of this. But let's not also forget the law of commerce, of international trade. You know, for so long, the international economic order has been built upon prem the, the, the premise of the free flow of, of information, the free flow of services, the free flow of commerce. And so now we're running up into these sort of international law concepts where 
some of these traditional notions that have helped build the internet, those very same folks are now uh, talking about perhaps, you know, splintering the internet or drawing borders on information as well as on uh, trade and commerce. So I think it's, it's uh, often easy or easy for us to fall into a trap where we kind of conceptually split these ideas apart, but actually for it to all make sense, you do need to find ways to make it all fit together. That would be my thought, Crystal. Great. So, uh, so a bunch of different sort of pieces of international law have already been put on the table, and I want to go back to that and just just ask if you had to pick sort of a dominant one or two areas of international law that you think regulate information operations or or prohibit information operations. What are the most relevant areas of law, and do you see those those areas as needing clarification or updating in light of information operations? I don't know who who'd like to take that one on first. Robin, can we come to you? Sure, yes. Um, so yeah, I would go back to what um, Harriet and Yen said about, I think sort of the most relevant concept in international law for information operations is the concept of a prohibited intervention. And um, as I think they alluded to, the challenge there is, you know, taking sort of the pieces of that doctrine. Um, so, and, um, intervention into the domain reserve of a state that has this element of coercion. And then like, I think Gans was suggesting, identifying, well, do we, when do information operations reach that level? When are they actually going after something that's within the domain reserve of the state? And when are they sufficiently coercive vis-a-vis um, -vis the decisions that the government of that foreign state is taking um, to, to actually violate international law. There are, are some states, of course, China and Russia, um, where I am right now, uh, that would say that, and most comments about, for example, criticism of um, human rights abuses, that, that those violate international law, that they violate their sovereignty um, and their internal affairs. I, I think that there most certainly of, of the West is not adopting that view, but it can be really tempting to go in that direction when we're the ones that are, that are under attack. I do think that um, there are some pretty clear examples of when we would reach that prohibited intervention threshold. I do, my personal view is that, for example, information operations that are disrupting the government delivery of services uh, designed to halt the spread of a pandemic I think that easily gets you up to the threshold of a prohibited intervention. I think it's um, information operations that are targeting the views of voters, I think very rarely is going to get you there because it's not impacting the decision of the state. It's impacting political views of the population. Um, and if, we, if it were the case that you, the receipt of misinformation was itself coercive, then I, I think it would be hard to argue that we had ever actually had a free election. So I think it's, it's a little bit, that argument sort of unravels as you, as you try to apply it in real world. So um, I'll leave it there and, and, and hear what the others have to say. Well, let, let me just pick up on, on the two kinds of disinformation that you mentioned, which is, I guess, two of the most prominent kinds we've seen in the last year or so is disinformation related to the U.S. election and then disinformation related to COVID. So uh, maybe we'll put those on the table as um, two examples we can all have in mind in thinking through this question of how international law applies. Again, you mentioned self-determination. I know this is something you've written on. Can you um, just unpack that a little bit? How does self-determination fit in um, to this legal landscape? Yeah, I mostly pursued that because I found um, the intervention uh, slash sovereignty um, framework to be unhelpful for thinking about information operations, at least in the electoral and political context. So, I mean, I think I basically agree with 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 Robin that um, you know an intervention framework is usually not going to condemn um, you know troll farm activity or some sort of other. Um, uh, you know, election uh, disinformation. Um, that's why I think self-determination is the more helpful framework, um, not just because it, um, I, I think, proves that these information operations can be illegal under international law. It's also because 
I think self-determination gets at the very unique and distinct harm of cyber operations that interfere in an election. And that's, it's really not a territorial violation. It's not even a kind of sovereignty violation. It's a political violation. And what it's attacking is in a democratic system, the ability of the people to select their own destiny, which is exactly what the right of self-determination um, is designed to protect. So I think of that as being the, you know, the, the core right that's violated there under international law. Of course, it's, that's going to give you a, a definite answer for election interference. It's not going to be as helpful for talking about, um, you know, for example, COVID, um, you know, vaccine distrib- uh, disinformation like you were, you were asking about. But I think it, it really sort of speaks to what the, what the issue is. Um, with election um, uh, uh, interference. One problem, though, I think, is that self-determination is kind of this forgotten concept in international law. It's sort of universally recognized as a central pillar, but it's rarely applied and it's rarely used as kind of the key uh, legal piece in an an argument because I think international lawyers would prefer to to shy away from it. Um, So part of what I want to do is kind of rehabilitate self-determination as a viable option. Great. And Harriet, I think you were the first person to mention intervention. I don't know. Do you, do you think that intervention is sufficiently definite, sufficiently well settled at the, at the margins here to address either election-related disinformation or COVID-related disinformation? Well, I think it's, it's definitely, as I said, quite an uncertain area of law anyway. So it is challenging. But actually, I think COVID has given us a really interesting example of where it could apply. And I agree with Robin on that. Um, uh, just looking at the Australian definition of this principle, which is uh, where one state effectively deprives another state of the ability to control, decide upon or govern matters of an inherently sovereign nature, either directly or indirectly in matters that a state basically has state sovereignty over. So it's kind of um, subverting that state's will, taking away that state's ability to have free will or control the way that it governs. Um, in certain areas. And obviously, um, sovereign areas include um, sort of the the, the state of health of the nation and um, essential medical facilities. And when we think about the vaccine um, as an essential medical facility, because um, obviously a state wants to ensure that its um, population is protected, that um, that its hospitals are not overwhelmed, and also there are knock-on effects for the economy. So it's a really quite extreme example in some ways, but it's one that we're all living through. We can really see there are attempts if if there's, for example, an information operation that says a vaccine's not safe. And as a result, the population uptake of that vaccine is significantly reduced, um, such that the really the effectiveness of the vaccine is is itself reduced. Then then that I I could would consider is is a violation of the of the non-intervention principle. Um, I would agree with Robin that the, the sort of elections context is harder. Um, and I can see why it's important to explore other areas of international law as well. So, um, uh, you know, self-determination being one of them. I, I think in terms of the non-intervention principle, there are scenarios where it would apply. And in fact, some states have come out with their views to say that they think it could apply. I think New Zealand in November um, said that it would reply, for example, if it um, meant that a, a state's population weren't able to vote or if a vote tally was interfered with. And I think the UK has um, also specified that um, changing the results of an election could violate the non-intervention principle. But as we know, many of the information operations are, fall below that kind of threshold. Those are quite, again, extreme examples of almost interfering with the infrastructure rather than actually with people's minds. And that's where it does become more difficult. But on the other hand, I think... Um, it's important to be able to draw a line somewhere and coercion, the coercion threshold provides some kind of threshold, even though it may be hard to apply and it has to be applied on the facts. Whereas something like the rule, the principle of sovereignty, it's, it's more vague. There's many more different views on, on where the thresholds are there. Um, so I think it is something where we need to do more work, but where uh, with states coming out with their views, there's definitely more potential um, to apply it in this area. Yeah, it does feel like the momentum has has shifted in favor of, of clarifying um, intervention. And a lot more states, as you mentioned, some specific examples have begun to make statements trying to clarify and give some particular examples. So I want to pivot away from international law and also ask about states' domestic laws. So we've seen states use criminal laws, economic sanctions as a way to attempt to deal with um, disinformation operations, hacking operations, all sorts of different cybersecurity-related incidents. 
And I'm curious how, how effective you think uh, domestic law is maybe as contrasted to international law. So Sujit, could we come to you on that one? Yeah, Christian, look, I think domestic law can be a very effective way of at least um, highlighting the problem of malign information operations and providing a means of attribution, right? But it really does take an all tools type approach. In other words, criminal indictments just by themselves are not gonna solve the problem for the very obvious reason that typically the bad actors are outside of the reach of the you know, uh, criminal law uh, sort of authorities of the, the country that's you know, making its, making its uh, indictment. Um, I think economic tools are appropriate as long as they're seen as being justified. In other words, there's a basis for what uh, a public sort of explanation for why economic sanctions have been levied. Uh, there's obviously always the military option uh, as long as it's done appropriately and sort of in a principled way. Um, so it really does take an all tools approach. Uh, I'll focus just a minute on domestic criminal law because I think it's a very, very interesting you know, uh, idea. Um, I've seen even in sort of my own experience that US domestic law has adjusted a little bit to the concept of uh, malign foreign influence operations. Think about the role of the indictment in our criminal justice system. I was looking at rule seven in the federal rules of criminal procedure earlier today, which is you know, the, the rule that sets out the requirements for an indictment under federal law. All it really says is that any indictment has to have a basic recitation of the facts. That's it. <laughs> and in your typical American criminal law indictment, you know, you'll often see a bare bones just sort of here are the basic elements and here are the basic facts, and that'll be enough to justify you know, charging a massive drug trafficking operation. And yet what we've seen in the influence context are these very detailed indictments that the Justice Department has issued with very little chance that anyone's going to be apprehended. But the function of the indictment is less about getting people you know, hands-on, pulling them into court, and trying them in a court of law but rather two things. Number one, laying out factually what the investigation has uncovered. And secondly, attribution, which is a very important concept in international law for, for the obvious reason. So I think domestic law has a very important place. I'm not unbiased in this, obviously, having spent the last several years at the, the Justice Department, but I don't think it's a solution. You know, it's not, certainly not the 100% uh, solution. But I think domestic law can have a, a very uh, significant role in all of this, the only danger, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to my other, my other co-panelists, you don't ever want, in at least in a rule of law system, for the domestic criminal law apparatus to be seen as a political tool. In other words, there's country X issuing another indictment just to sort of make a statement on the international stage. I think that's why the, the sort of culture behind every you know, indictment is important, at least in the American system, which is what I know the most about. I mean, typically, indictments are seen as being, you know, passed on by a, a grand jury, an independent group of citizens. Uh, typically, there is not information in an indictment unless the government can prove each fact beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the, the standard in the U.S. courts. That's not to say that they're still not seen sometimes as political tools, but it's very important to protect that, right? You don't want these indictments to be seen as simply the latest, you know, administration trying to settle scores with somebody else. But if you can resist that urge, and I think domestic law can be a very effective way, at least of attributing behavior and giving people information about what's what's actually going on. Let me just ask a, a follow up to that that sort of bridges domestic and international, because we've seen obviously the United States has been the, the country sort of out there the most using indictments in just the way Sujit described. But we haven't really seen that in other countries so much. We've seen some sanctions. We've seen some statements about attribution, but not so much criminal process. I'm curious, I don't know if any of our other panelists want to weigh in on that. Is that something you would you would expect to see more of for other countries? Do you think that would help sort of solidify um, you know, norms of behavior, at least, if not international law on the international level? I can offer a thought quickly, Kristen, and of course, Please. welcome everyone's input. So I will say, you know, over the last few years, we have seen more governments beyond the U.S. attributing malign behavior to particular nation states. So I think about WannaCry, NotPetya, it was quite significant, actually, when other nations beyond the United States, I mean, the UK, Australia, and others, uh, publicly joined into the, the public announcement attributing that conduct to Russia or to North Korea. Those are diplomatic efforts, right? That was very significant. On the question of indictments, I would not be surprised if over the next few years, we do see other nations 
using their sort of domestic criminal law system to attribute and highlight this kind of behavior. I would not also be surprised to see other nations that perhaps are not known for their rule of law values similarly coming out with these types of, you know, uh, grand pronouncements. And that's the danger, is that ultimately you just have competing indictments um, and the whole thing looks like a political farce. That, that's exactly the danger, I think. Yeah, and so you also study criminal law. Do you have any thoughts on this issue? Yeah, so I mean, I just wanted to, you know, make something uh, explicit, which I think was implicit in Sujit's uh, a point, which, you know, all of which I, I, I echo. So when the, when the Justice Department issues an indictment, um, it's a way for them to provide information to the public about the election interference and in so doing help to negate slightly the impact, right? So it's almost like a kind of countermeasure because um, what makes the election interference um, uh, effective is in part its covert nature. People don't know that it's there. Um, and you know, if you attribute the behavior to a particular um, state and then also publicize this to the, to the voting public, you help unwind a little bit some of the, the pernicious impact. And I think that's, that's important. Um, I think it's only one way. And if the, you know, if the United States had other ways of disclosing information, the problem is there's a culture in our intelligence agencies um, based on sort of prior paradigms of behavior um, of, of not disclosing information in the intelligence context um, to the public. Um, and so I wonder if maybe some other countries will be a little bit more sort of free to, um, you know, provide information about what other states are doing covertly um, uh, and not have to rely on, on criminal prosecutions as a, as a tool. The other thing I would say is that, you know, overall, in terms of the, the promise of domestic criminal law, I think one thing that domestic law does very well is if you look at all of the various laws that apply to election participation, they all circle around a common theme, which is rules regarding who can participate in an election. Um, you know, rules about who can vote. Insiders can vote, um, outsiders are not allowed to vote. Um, who can fund, um, uh, make political contributions, who can spend money on elections. Um, it's a way of sort of dividing and making a boundary. And I think in general, that's a, a good way of thinking about domestic legal regulation in this area. But one thing that's interesting is that the, um, the government ends up applying laws that are sort of ill-fitting um, for this particular context, right? So, you know, they don't really go at, um, you know, disinformation itself. They um, go after a foreign country spending money on an election to run a troll farm. Right. Um, and it's kind of a, you know, a poor fit. And I, I would like to see some kind of additional domestic legal statutes targeting this behavior more directly. Robin, did you want to weigh in as well? Yeah, just sort of one comment that I think it riffs a little bit off of both of what Sujit and Jens were saying. Um, I think that the part of the practical reality is that um, especially with something like indictments and telling the story of how all this is working in cyberspace, again, as opposed to like communist magazines being mailed around the United States, is that it is the intelligence community. It is the National Security Agency and it is GCHQ maybe, but it's not really anybody else. And, and I think that, I mean, there are, there are other players, but those are the heavy hitters who have the information. And yeah, there's a culture of not sharing that, but it's, it's, it's not really just a culture. I think that um, maybe sells it a bit short because their primary mission is to collect foreign intelligence information that's used for a, a host of other um, activities. And, and a lot of that is shared then with a lot of other countries for the purposes of um, countering foreign intelligence activities that are, um, or understanding you know, what a, another government's about to do that may actually be more important, uh, it may be more important to stop those activities than it is to get those countries to stop trying to participate even covertly um, in, in elections. So I think it, it's, um, there is potentially a lot of sharing that's going to happen, but as a, a practical matter, you're going to have to have the, the private sector is going to have to get a lot better at identifying this. And they are, I mean, the difference in like Facebook and Twitter and so forth from, 
2016, 2018 to 2020. And I think the extent to which they relied on the FBI and um, NSA for information about what was happening on the platforms was far less in 2020 than it was in 2018. They are learning how to identify these things. Um, and then I think on the, on the other end, end of the spectrum, that I think what domestic law can do, and this, this may sort of cut against a little bit of, of what, um, what I think maybe Yanz was saying is that domestic law can create space for other speakers and other participants in the marketplace of ideas, if you will, to use sort of a trite phrase, um, but so that you are bringing kind of all your, you know, all your tools to the fight, which includes the rest of the population. Um, so I, I think um, some of that might involve more regulation of social media companies, at least more disclosure requirements. Certainly the foreign agents registration uh, requirements that we have in the United States is helpful. But, um, but again, I think once you start locking down speech and you have government actors trying to decide which speech to lock down and whose it is, uh, then I, it, it gets hard to stop, I think. Yeah, so I do want to pick up on the, this idea of the role of the private parties and particularly the, the social media platforms. Obviously, that was a huge issue in the wake of the 2016 election. And, and since then, we've seen many um, state-sponsored information operations that involve technology, social media companies. And we've seen those companies attempting to respond. So I, I'm curious for your thoughts on just sort of how those companies should, you think, be understanding their role in addressing government information operations should they be looking to international law for guidance? Do we leave them just regulated by domestic law? Curious for your thoughts. Uh, Harriet, can we come to you? Sure, yeah. Um, and I think as, as Robin said, there's a lot going on in this area. It's, it's really good to see some self-regulation by the major platforms, Facebook, um, with its uh, coordinated inauthentic behavior policy and monthly reports and Twitter, also uh, foreign, in, foreign interference. Um, and of course, it's not just the social media companies that need to do this. It's also the search engines like Google and Google owning YouTube, because these are big conduits for uh, information operations, too. Um, and there's also a really big role for the network providers um, to actually help with attribution and detection of this, this kind of operation and to work with states to help them. Obviously, technical attribution is only one aspect of attribution, but it's a really important one. Um, so it's kind of good to see that there's some self-regulation, but I think that also needs to be melded with some regulation from the state as well. And I think what needs to guide the self-regulation is not for me so much international law as international human rights law, um, in particular, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, um, which I think quite helpfully set out this framework um, for policies and procedures to uh, identify the risk of harm and try and mitigate that harm. And we're starting to see, of course, much more uh, sort of mandatory due diligence laws as well um, from various governments. Um, but I think, as I said, I don't think that self-regulation is enough. I think that needs to be in concert with regulation from governments or institutions. And we're actually starting to see some interesting co-regulatory models coming out of Europe. So as you're probably aware, the Euro European Commission has just come out with its Digital Services Act in draft form. And the UK has put proposals for an online safety bill. And both of those operate on this kind of systemic regulation. So rather than regulating the content itself, they regulate the systems and they do that quite um, in an agile way through codes of practice that can be updated, um, basically involving monitoring what, what the companies are doing and trying to push for greater transparency. Transparency being key in this area because we still don't know exactly what's going on half the time on these platforms and why and how. So I think that push for transparency is really important. Um, and the final thing I'd say about regulation is that the co-regulatory model hopefully mitigates the risk of harming freedom of expression because it's really easy to over-regulate in this area. And we've seen that with countless laws around the world that are draconian and that chill free speech. And it's trying to find that balance between um, kind of having a debate and, and encouraging interaction, but on the other hand, regulating the really tough stuff. And disinformation is hard because it's not illegal most of the time. It's a sort of lawful but harmful type harm. So I think the, regu the regulatory model that's coming out in Europe at the moment is because it's systemic and doesn't focus, focus on the content, it's risk-based and proportionate. And I think it could potentially be quite interesting as a kind of global model for the future. 
Great. Sujit, can we come to you? Thoughts on this question? Are there yeah. Possible? Well, I think Harry had raised some really interesting questions, you know, particularly about the role of, again, getting back to domestic versus international law. I mean, some of the, the trends that she mentioned in Europe are very, very important to follow. I think another important trend to follow coming out of Europe is the Schrems case, right? Um, which, you know, the defendant in the Schrems case is Facebook. And the challenge there is the sort of, you know, transferring of personal data across the Atlantic. And the European Court of Justice, which is ultimately a domestic court, it's a European court, essentially opining on the GDPR and saying that essentially that the U.S. Uh, you know, intelligence community has too much access to this data in so many words. And you know, the, the result of a lot of this is that companies are encrypting data as it goes across their networks. And that has a tremendous uh, uh, implication for detecting malign activity, right? Think about it. I mean, intelligence agencies are often in the business of monitoring what's happening on networks. And if that information is end-to-end -end encrypted, it becomes much harder for intelligence uh, agencies to know what's going on. And what implications does that have for the success or not of malign influence operations? I think that's a very interesting question, again, coming out of Europe. Um, so once again, and I, I mentioned this at the outset, we see the, the sort of uh, law of states, right? The law of non-intervention butting up against the law of sort of, you know, uh, commercial data flows. Um, what is the ECJ? I mean, originally it was a trade court, right? Established to re resolve uh, economic disputes in Europe. So we have all of these concepts kind of butting together now. Um, national security issues implicating commercial issues, the role of personal data in all of this. How do governments, you know, contend with it? Um, I don't think there are any clear answers. And that's really why the next few years are gonna be so important, both on a domestic law perspective, as well as an international law perspective. And I don't think it's gonna be you know, easy to neatly split these concepts up because they're invariably all looped in with each other. Great, Harriet, did you wanna uh, comment on Sujit's thoughts there? Well, I absolutely agree with Sujit that there's a there's a whole many, many different frameworks going on in terms of this area of information operations. So, um, I would back that up, but I wanted to just flag one other thing that's going on that I think is quite important on the regulatory front, um, and it's also coming out of Europe. It's the European Democracy Action Plan, which is um, designed to tackle information operations, actually. Um, it's designed to, to tackle disinformation, but also um, information influence operations um, and foreign interference. And at the moment, the European Commission is still working on definitions and it's working with stakeholders, including the tech companies. But I think it's quite an interesting attempt to actually try to regulate disinformation. Um, the UK is only planning to regulate disinformation in relation to anti-vax. So disinformation that affects the individual, but not necessarily democracy itself. Whereas the European Democracy Action Plan is about the effect of society as a whole of some of these information operations, including um, the effects on elections. Um, and the fact that this has been so difficult um, shows just, just where, where the really the debates are in terms of drawing the line. Um, but I think they are starting to make some progress in the fact it's a multi-stakeholder uh, consultation, which from the start has involved both tech companies, civil society and the regulator, um, gives it some prospect of kind of, again, being perhaps quite groundbreaking in this area. So we have just a few minutes left, but, but before I, I ask you for your final comments, I wanted to just ask um, an additional question that sort of focuses on a particular kind of information operation that we're, we're beginning to see. And one that I think, I think law, both domestic and international, maybe has some difficulty dealing with. And that's the possibility of instances where actual documents are altered before being released. So not just the usual hack and leak operation, not just the normal espionage, but the sort of playing on the credibility of actual documents and mixing in altered documents. And we've seen an example of this already with respect to uh, COVID vaccines. So the European Medicines Agency it reported in December that it had been breached and that documents related to the Pfizer vaccine had been accessed. And then in January, it warned that before the hackers had released the documents, um, they had actually altered some of them in ways that appeared to be intended to undermine the confidence in the vaccine. So that's a, a specific example, but I'm curious what, what you think about how effective international law or domestic law are in um, dealing with that kind of an information operation, one that alters the integrity of the, the hacked information. Robin, can we come to you? Sure, yeah, there's, um, 
So I, I think we have had that um, in, the, in the past, but it tended to be maybe more in the sort of military intelligence environment. There's a story of um, the Soviets basically got a hold of a war plan um, for war in Europe. Uh, I think it, um, I don't remember the, the exact years, I'm sorry, it's escaping me, but anyway, um, and they made slight changes to it to basically make it look like we're, the United States' plan was to nuke Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think in, in some ways the, and, and then just the fact that, it, that it's so easy now to get a hold of that information. But again, I think the example that, that you provided is an example of how the information environment works the other way as well, where the company is able to come out and say, no, 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 like here's the real information. And of course, there's always the damages, there's always damage done, right? Um, and, I, and what I think that does is put a lot more pressure on organizations to really carefully guard their credibility. And, and in the US military, that is a huge, huge issue um, because we are around the world, we are doing scary things. Um, you know, using force against you know foreign nationals in, in foreign countries, detaining people. Um, you know, we, we're still recovering, right, from Abu Ghraib and all of those kinds of things. And um, and you hear a lot of discussion about how we really have to be credible both to the American people and then to the other populations that that we're working with, so that when and and Every single day, there's craziness in the information environment about what we're doing. Like the number of weddings, supposedly, that we bomb. Sure, every once in a while we bomb a wedding. Not as many as people say we bomb, right? So, but it's very easy for somebody to call the New York Times and say, I was at this wedding and the Americans just bombed us. So we're constantly trying to build our own credibility, trying to get to the bottom of what, you know, what information is in the information environment about our operations and then trying to put out truthful information to reach as many people as we can. So I don't know that it's so much that the law can help with that because I think sometimes if there's a law and people are seen as, or organizations are seen as just checking the boxes, meeting their legal requirement, that actually can have the effect of undermining their credibility um, and, and then making the information operation kind of more effective. So, um, so yeah, so I don't think I think don't think it's, it's terribly new, but it is something that can be dealt with. I'm not sure that the law is the way to do it. Thoughts from anyone else on uh, integrity attacks? I would just add to that. I mean, I think Robin mentioned some very interesting examples. I mean, I think from you know the Zimmerman Telegram, or you know, in 1857, rumors about you know pig fat and cow fat being used on you know. Uh, artillery cartridges during the, the so-called sepoy mutiny, right? I mean, their information has been manipulated all sorts of different ways over the period of the last several hundred years. You know, is law really the way to deal with it? I don't know. Uh, if anything, I worry that, you know, legal principles could be um, diminished because when, whenever you try to sort of prove that something is true or not true, that inherently sort of puts the legal system at trial, right? And then people might start questioning the very tribunal that's adjudicating whether something is true or not true. And then you've almost kind of, you know, counterintuitively, negatively impacted the rule of law. So, you know, it's a little bit of an abstract question, but it feels, it feels to me like it's not really a legal question. It's more about making sure that people are fully informed in whatever way you can do it, you know, making sure that bad ideas are met with good ideas and letting people ultimately decide for themselves. Harriet or Jens, do you want to take this one on? Okay, well, I'll, I'll ask each of our panelists just for your, your concluding thoughts. I, I feel like maybe we shouldn't end the American Society of International Law panel on law can't help us, but so maybe we'll end more optimistically. I'm not sure, but I'll ask you each for your final thoughts on information operations and international law or domestic law. Uh, Jens, can we start with you? Yeah, I mean, I have, I, I have a wish list in terms of things that I would like. And, you know, chief among them, is I would like some more clarity in just the United States um, about what agency really is supposed to tackle um, information operations. Because I just feel like every agency that's out there really is not designed to deal with it. The NSA is about um, you know, signals uh, collection. 
um, and acquiring uh, information. Um, the U.S. military, of course, has great cybercom, but they're really about um, countering military threats using military tools, um, not disclosing information about um, you know foreign disinformation operations. Uh, the CIA also not in the business of disclosing information to the American public. In fact, they're usually about the opposite. They're about keeping our secrets, not disclosing information. Um, like Sujit talked about, the Justice Department, um, mostly about criminal prosecutions. And if something isn't about putting people in prison, they usually don't know what to do with the situation. We also have some agencies that are doing uh, infrastructure security, like protecting voting systems, all good but still not the same thing as disclosing information about uh, information operations. So I would really love that we you know, got an institution within the federal government that was tasked with dealing with that. Sujit, final thoughts? No, uh, I know we're at time, Kristen, so I'm happy to, to stop it there. This has been wonderful. Great, uh, so we've got just a, a minute or two left here to wrap up. Um, Robin and then maybe Harriet will come to you last. I think Jens makes a really great point, um, and it's something that takes up a lot of time um, when you're working in, each, in the in U.S. government agency on these things. And I think maybe part of the reason that we don't have an entity that um, that would be responsible for this is because we we do have the First Amendment, and we do have this idea that the government's not supposed to be um, controlling the information environment, and we are very uncomfortable with it. I mean, I'm. I'm really impressed actually with the, I think the way um, leaders in DOD dealt with this problem set, very, very careful about the role of the military in, um, in any sort of national security entity, but getting into this space, very limited in, in what we think it's appropriate for us to be doing. And I think that's kind of true in the international law world as well. I and mean, we do have, I think the, um, the human right of free expression, including the, the right to receive, is probably one of the most broadly agreed upon um, human rights in international law, even if in implementation it, it looks pretty different in different parts of the world. But, um, but I think in part, that, that part in, in some ways, that's why I think we don't have like a infra bureau of information. And, um, you know, I... I, had, I was in quarantine for 18 days on my way to Saudi Arabia. And so I would listen as I like paced around the perimeter fence. I was listening to like dystopian novels, like audiobooks, And, and there, aren't, there aren't any where there's this sort of freewheeling information environment. And then they're set up, someone sets up like a, a government institution that's going to control the information environment and everyone's happy. Usually it's sort of, it's, it's kind of the opposite. And so... I think my closing thought is just for us to, even though it's so incredibly aggravating to have this happening to us, is to just be really, really cautious as, as we try and um, say that certain activities are illegal and really think about what we might lose if we take that position. So, and, and thank you so much. I'm so excited to um, continue to, to follow all of your work and, and continue the dialogue. Great, Harriet, final thoughts? Sure. Um, well, I think we've heard that this is a really difficult area to regulate information operations. Um, but I would like to finish on a positive note. So three positives that I, I'm sort of hearing. Um, and one is that I think, you know, more and more states are coming out with their views on this, um, about how certain rules of international law actually apply in this context, um, particularly the principle of non-intervention. And actually not only coming out with sort of general positions, which many states have done, but also quite specific examples of where they think the law applies. And that, you know, people might disagree with some of those positions, but it helps to uh, pr sort of push forward the debate. Um, and so it gives us something to actually get our teeth into as academics as well and commentators. So I think that's quite positive. Um, I guess the UN processes will encourage that as well with the sort of the encouragement to put forward national positions in the, in the annex to the group of government experts. Um, I think another positive is that academics and government legal advisors and tech companies are talking to each other much more than they used to about these kind of things. So some of us have been involved in this Oxford process um, spearheaded by the Blavatnik Institute in, in Oxford University um, to look at how rules of international law apply to cyberspace in specific contexts, including elections and healthcare. 
Um, and that's been quite exciting because Microsoft has been there and other tech companies, Twitter have been there, government legal advisors, academics from around the world. And through uh, the involvement of the tech companies, we've got much better understanding of what's actually happening in terms of this information and how we can think about the interface between the sort of facts and the law and, and the tech developments. And I think having that sort of interaction rather than tech people acting in silo with lawyers is, is actually quite productive. Um, I think we've heard that the law is only one part of this puzzle, um, that there are many sort of solutions to this and, um, and they kind of have to interact as, as Sujit said. So um, for me, media literacy is a really important part of tackling information operations. Also having a kind of diverse and robust news landscape. Um, and I think finally, sort of the whole tech research to try and detect these threats. Um, so ideally a kind of holistic approach where people work together uh, and that's partly why it's been so great to be on this panel. So thank you very much for having me. And thank you to each of you for, for sharing your time and your expertise. We do have a Zoom room opening up for 30 minutes following the panel to continue the conversation. So I hope we'll have a chance to talk to you and to some of our audience members there. Thanks very much.